Good afternoon, colleagues, and welcome to our third and last uh, public lecture this second semester of the year. And we are honored to have the last public lecture being given by one of our ESOLOMSO fellows. So, but I'll leave the introductions to uh, Pumla, who is going to introduce Ankata more officially. But I would like to welcome you all. I do see that we've been honored to have the Deputy Vice Chancellor Research for Stellenbosch University. Um, Sibu, welcome. Um, I can see also my colleague, Danny Fischer, who I haven't seen you for a while, so it's good to see you. Um, a number of colleagues are joining online, and all of you fellows and visitors, you're most welcome. Um, for the public lecture, I have to introduce myself. So for the fellows, please um, indulge me a bit. But I just say I'm Professor Edward Chirumida. I'm the director of STIRS. Um, and I just describe myself as the chief servant. So I try to make sure that everybody uh, is happy at STIRS. And so you're most welcome. And we're looking forward to a very engaging conversation, and some of you have already looked at the YouTube clip, and I'm sure that uh, 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 Kata can only do better than the clip. I'm just trying to set her up uh, here. Um, so before we do that, um, just to say that um, on Thursday we'll have our fellow seminar and Carlos will be presenting uh, on Thursday. So please um, uh, remember, remember that. Um, and as usual, um, Dr. Christoph Poe, who, who is our senior program manager, will handle the question and, and answers. And at that stage, we'll also recognize uh, some of the colleagues that have joined us in this, uh, in this public lecture as well as colleagues online. I'm told that the online signing is also very active. So we're pleased that um, the public and the scholarly community are paying attention to what is being done at STIRS. And in the same regard, we are thankful that we are in that space and we can uh, contribute to the, uh, to the development and growth and, and, and conversations around uh, significant topics. So that's why we define ourselves as a creative space for the mind, and we also say that we are the Institute for Advanced Study uh, instead of Advanced Studies. Um, but, um, you know, we can also have a conversation and a seminar on the difference between studies and, and study. But that will be for the next day. May I introduce Pumla, who is going to um, formally introduce um, Kata. Pumla was very well introduced by the Wright and Steers Artist Residence, Jennifer, um, on, on the 28th of September when Pumla gave her fellow seminar. So I'm not going to compete with, uh, uh, with Jennifer. But suffice it to say that Pumla is professor in the Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences at Stellenbosch University, where she currently holds the South African National Research Foundation Chair in Violent Histories and Transgenerational Trauma, and, the, and, and, the, and also holds the Research Chair in Historical Trauma and Transformation. She's editor and co-author of several other academic publications and has delivered memorable um, and many scholarly keynote and endowed uh, lectures. And she's been a very, very, very influential motivational speaker. And I attended the last uh, keynote that you gave to the, to the young people that thought that they were the top uh, graduates at Stellenbosch University where she reminded us that it's not about excellence, it's about service. So thank you very much, Pumla, in that, in that regard. But I think most importantly for her is that she's a STIRS fellow. And on that note, I would like to invite Pumla to introduce uh, Nkata. Thank you.
Thank you so much. Um, and it's such a privilege to, uh, to introduce you, Gatha, and our dear director. Thank you for the wonderful and warm, hearty, hearty introduction of myself. I appreciate it. The first thing you notice when you read the history of Dr. Ngatha Kabila's academic credentials and professional trajectory is that her research interests grew out of the social political realities in her country that have moved her and inspired her. Beginning with her years in law school at the University of Nairobi, where she obtained her Bachelor of Laws degree and her studies in Kenya School of Law, where she obtained her postgraduate diploma in legal practice, she was drawn to the complexities of the intersection of the law with real life issues on the ground, concerns with gender and governance issues, human rights, and research on the various commissions established following the violence that erupted in the post election period in Kenya in 2007. Key among her passions is the Kenyan constitution and the Kenya, how the Kenyan constitution, whether it responds to the everyday realities of people on the ground or as she puts it in one of the interviews that I listened to and read, the law in the books versus the law in action. An advocate of the High Court of Kenya, these are questions that continue to energize her and to inspire her. These issues remain central for Gatha throughout her graduate studies at the Harvard Law School, where she received her master's in law in law's degree in 2008 and her doctoral degree in 2015. Intellectually uncompromising about a transdisciplinary approach to law, this critical perspective seems to inform her idea of the need to transform law. In other words, the need for transformative approaches to the law and in her words, to quote, Africanize and indigenize the law. These interests shine through all her scholarly publications. In her articles, she opens up debates that challenge the taken for granted constitutional and international legal frameworks that are at odds with people's realities. A cursory glance at some of her scholarship I was intrigued by one of the titles of her articles, Wainjiku and the Wig, Kenya's Legal Transformation Dance. Gatha explains that Wainjiku translates as the voice of the people. The wig, of course, a reference to the massive woolly wig still worn by advocates and judges in her country. Thank goodness we no longer have that here. <laughs> in this dance, sometimes the wig wins, she says. Sometimes the voices of the people triumph. It is, I quote, the bricolage of the dance or the encounter that helps us understand the kind of law that is operational in African social political contexts, unquote. It is a dance that she explores as well in her current work on the law of commissions, a comparative investigation on the role of commissions in the African context. The sheer power of Dr. Kabila's thinking is so vital because these commissions were forged at times of transition with a transformative vision, yet 
questions remain about their impact in transitional justice and political processes for social justice in African countries. The many honors that Ngatha has received globally in recognition of her work attest to the importance of her contribution to her field. She has been a fellow at some of the most prestigious research institutes, not least our own special STIAS, Isolongsi Fellowship. That has to be at the top of them all. <laughs> Next follows the rest. In Berlin, at Princeton, at Cornell, where she was named by Cornell's International Center as the Distinguished Africanist Scholar. At Harvard, she was a fellow at the W.E.B. Du Bois Hutchins Center and a faculty mentor at the Institute of Global Law and Policy. With teaching excellence awards from a senior lectureship at Nairobi University, at Harvard University, she has transformed her passions in research into teaching and introduced her topics, the topics of her research, to her classes with new courses that she has developed and she has started teaching these courses since her return and since her PhD studies. Now she's leading with these topics, international research teams globally, again, as we say in my language, her step, you can hear her step in closer, we say is in music, is their vagal, which is to say her footsteps in the scholarly community are loud enough to be heard across the seas. Gartha's work is truly emblematic of critical scholarship in law that bridges the disciplines of law and humanities. Friends, I give you Gatha. Oh my goodness. <gasps> Pumla. <laughs> Thank you so much um, for that really, really generous introduction. I really, really appreciate that. Um, and thank you, Edward. Thank you to all the fellows. Thank you for being here. I really, really appreciate your support and your being here, as well as those who are online. I really hope my mother is online. If you're there. <laughs> Hello, mom. So. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all very much and happy Utamaduni Day to all my fellow Kenyans who may be online. Happy Utamaduni Day is cultural day, so today is a pu public holiday in Kenya. So what is the future of law in Africa? What should be the shape of future legal systems in Africa? Should legal systems remain dual or multiple? In what ways might law in Africa be fitted together to form a single unified whole? A court of African law, as Lord Denning famously declared. These questions were at the heart of a conversation that took place in London in 1960 at the height of the decolonization process. Lawyers, judges, legal practitioners, and legal scholars were in attendance. The London Conference decreed classical legal thought as the future of law in Africa. Classical legal thought is characterized by certainty, predictability, objectivity, stability, and uniformity. More than 60 years later, after the London Conference, independent Africa has lived the London Conference's proclamations. What has Africa's experience been? What has been achieved? Where does the law stand in mediating 
governance challenges. As Africa becomes the next frontier of growth, what is the role of law and governance in Africa? In this context, the Faculty of Law at the University of Nairobi and the Stellenbosch Institute for Advanced Studies, STIRS, organized the conference on the future of law and governance in Africa to revisit the conversations that took place in 1960 with Isolomso scholars from South Africa, from Ghana, from Benin, from Namibia, from Uganda, Tanzania, and Kenya. I hope Edwin is also online because he was also one of the participants. Um, so from different backgrounds, with scholars who are researching about plants and think that it has nothing to do with uh, nothing to do with law. Scholars who are working in labs, in chemistry, in economics, in anthropology. Um, we all came together to discuss African challenges, how and why such challenges persist, and the current solutions that are currently being implemented. The workshop assessed the future of law as predicted in the London Conference, and what other probable alternatives were in solving African challenges. In this discussion, we identified key challenges Africa faces today. We reframed these challenges and reflected on how the law produced by commissions is challenging classical legal thought. Commissions in Africa are breaking down the boundaries of law, illuminating law's rigidity, and challenging conventional understandings about law and what it constitutes in Africa. My presentation today is titled, The Future of Law and Governance in Africa. The future is a product of the past. We cannot understand where we are going without knowing where we are coming from. The future of law is, in Africa is a product of historical narratives renewed. The future of law is the sum parts of the past and the present. For us to understand how we got here, let's travel back in time in that high-speed bullet train that uh, Jennifer introduced us to. Let's travel back in time to a specific moment in history, the London Conference on the Future of Law in Africa. The year was 1960, the year of destiny, the break of a new dawn for Africa. The date was the 8th of January. The place was London. The Bishop Patridge Room of the Church House Westminster, to be precise, more than 60 years ago, at the height of the decolonization process, 60 delegates gathered in London to discuss the future of law. The 60 delegates included chief justices and judges from several African countries, attorney generals, solicitor generals, magistrates, barristers, customary court advisors, as well as academics from the University of London, Oxford, and Harvard. Only two lawyers in private practice were in attendance, and law societies were also not present. There were also no law teachers from Africa who were present. The conference was chaired by the retired Honorable Lord Denning, and the African countries represented included Sierra Leone, Nigeria, Liberia, Kenya, Tanganyika, which is present-day Tanzania, Uganda, Somaliland, Zanzibar, Northern Rhodesia, which is present-day Zambia, Nyasaland, present-day Malawi, and Botswanaland, present-day Botswana. As much as Francophone, Lusophone, and Hispanophone states were also invited, the conference mostly featured Anglophone countries. And though South Africa was not formally represented at the conference, the reading list and background papers at the conference included law texts written about South African native law in the 1940s and the 1950s when South Africa was still under apartheid. The conference was taking place at the height of the decolonization process, as I, mentored, as I mentioned, a time when statesmen and lawyers were meeting to frame new constitutions and negotiate new governance structures. One country after another was gaining independence from the shackles of colonial rule. This 1960 conference decided that the future of law would be guided by the following principles. Uniformity, where you can have it. Diversity, where you must have it. But in all cases, certainty. 
Secondly, ascertainment of African customary law to ensure predictability, uniformity, certainty, and objectivity, and to resolve conflicts between the different systems of law, given that we had different ethnic groups with multiple languages, Hindus, Muslims, and all different kinds of uh, people living within African contexts. And then thirdly, that African law would be molded in the direction of European law to ensure the evolution of a single unified system of law applicable throughout any given territory. Fourthly, to constitute a committee to review the provision of legal education as the future of the law depended on the proper education of legal practitioners. All in all, this conference decreed legal formalism, or as Duncan Kennedy would call it, classical legal thought, as the future of law in Africa. CLT would come with a particular lexicon, a particular grammar, a particular way of speaking, a particular way of dressing, and in the toolkit would be ideas of individual rights, formal equality, private law, freedom, positivism, unitary states, the free market, nation states, amongst others, were at the core of the law. This form of legal consciousness decreed boundaries between the public and the private, between the market and the state, between law and morality, between law and fact, between state and civil society, between law and religion, between law and all the other disciplines. As a migrated social structure, in Peter Eke's words, CLT would also entail wearing white powdered wigs and robes, speaking the Queen's English, legal English, speaking the language of Rylands versus Fletcher when speaking about uh, the doctrine of trespass, speaking the language of Marbury versus Madison when speaking about the supremacy of the Constitution. The CLT lexicon would be colorfully dressed with beautiful Latin words like cujus, cujus, solo, solo, sedit, nal ab initio, ad infinitum, ejus dem generis, eh, among many other Latin terms that I'm sure you may have heard some of your lawyer friends mention from time to time. These words would form part and parcel of every lawyer's everyday language in many parts of Africa. After 60 years of experience with classical legal thought, many governance questions remain unanswered and several tensions began to emerge. They include the question of land, who owns what and how, the question of representation, who appoints and who is appointed, the question of constitutionalism, is the law compatible with the realities on the ground, administration of justice, by whom and how will the interests of individuals and or communities be protected. Within each of these governance questions, several tensions began to emerge. This include the tension between individual rights and community rights, the tension between um, ethnic identity and national identity, tension between democracy, what was conceived as democracy versus national unity, tension between tradition and modernity, tensions between the formal and the informal, between the international and the local, between um, between the law in the books and the law in action, as Pumla mentioned. In what ways might we structure our governance systems so that they address our African problems, Africa's problems? How might we decolonize our governance systems and adopt innovative systems? How might we create endogenous development and governance models within the structural conditions we have in place. I'm sure that sounds familiar to you, Christoph, because these are some of the questions that we asked ourselves when Isolomso fellows from all over Africa gathered in Nairobi to discuss the future of law in Africa. And I'll now show a video, I'll just zoom into a video to that moment so that we can share in what happened during that conference. 
Viva Africa, viva Africa, viva Africa, viva Africa, viva Africa, viva Africa, viva, viva, viva Africa. not the first time that people have come together to talk about the future of law in Africa. In 1960, there was a conference, and I'll say a little bit about that. And then um, 60 years later, the kind of experience we've had with, um, with what was predicted, um, I'll also say something about that. And then now the, the 2023 Nairobi workshop on the future of law and governance in Africa. So what we hope to do in this 2023 Nairobi workshop on the future of law and governance is to, is to revisit this conversation that took place uh, 60 years ago in Westminster and then to critically interrogate Africa's greatest challenges and then to evaluate some of the solutions that have been uh, proposed to deal with these challenges. And so, uh, in terms of the topic, uh, you know, of law and governance, I also think about it in terms of looking back to look forward, because we're starting from 1960, that conference, you know, which was very, you know, the, there was also a lot of hope and excitement about the future of law in Africa. There is this implicit contract in academia worldwide that to be taken seriously as a scholar, you need to buy into ultimately the Enlightenment ideals and, the, and, and, and Cartesian rationalism to, that we inherited from the Eurocentric traditions. Africans have fallen into deep debts very, in various ways and have failed to come out of this situation because to date, we are still colonized in our minds. My research came out of uh, an inquiry as to whether when we talk about leaving no one behind, we also include hunter-gatherers in our respective countries. And many countries have these communities. I'm, I'm really trying to look at uh, women participation in agriculture. Um, currently the argument is that um, the Food and Agriculture Organization, the World Bank, these institutions have found that social protection has a role to play in, in um, creating an enabling environment for those in farming, yeah, all farmers basically. I would like us to form a presidential commission. Sure. We shall need half of the wealth from Central Bank to find out whether the president is a president without the presidential commission. Virtually all problems in Africa or all, pro all problems in Kenya will have a commission. And if you check our constitution, Kenyans didn't trust the government. So they put their trust in commission. Commissions then after 2010 turned into spaces really for state capture. Yeah, so there's a lot of people using uh, commissions to, for private gain, what we call, of course, state capture. To be a feminist is to hurl through canon of my exploding righteous fury, the cannibal named capitalism. It is to pronounce a death sentence on the ogre named imperialism. For me, to be a feminist is to unhood racism, to decry Zionism, to detonate apathy, to alterate tribalism. It is to neglect homophobia, to drown fanatism, to strangulate classism, to fumigate ethnic cleansing. May her soul rest in peace. So we came together um, to discuss the future of law and government in Africa. When some of you saw that title, you wondered, what am I going to say <laughs> in this particular convening? And I'm so glad that you all made it here and you were all able to say something. 
even if it's to say I have nothing to say, but <laughs> I'll just say this. <laughs> so you end up saying something when you thought you actually had nothing to say. I just want to say that every single contribution that has been made today and yesterday has been absolutely valuable and so important in contributing to shaping the future of law and governance in Africa. I think for me, spaces like these create um, what I would call a safe space where you can come and share and talk without fear of being judged. Uh, you could ask any question if something is not clear, something is not okay. You know, at times you end up saying things you wouldn't even say at work. At work it's stress for sure. <laughs> so you get this time to go off from this daily routine and uh, meet people that think so you know with a, a vision progressive vision to whom much is given because much has been given to you much is also required and therefore my challenge to you is that you exert yourselves your exercise your mind your collective brains to see how far we can move in this, in this endeavor uh, as we think about uh, the future of law and uh, governance in Africa. Let's clap for all the Isolomso fellows and everybody. <laughs> And thank you so much to Steers for making that possible. As we saw from the video, the 2023 Nairobi workshop set out to undertake a gigantic task by zooming into commissions to look at how they have navigated the various challenges facing Africa today. As we heard from Constantine Wasonga in the video, African governments are famous for establishing commissions to examine just about everything. And I see some of you nodding your heads. Many of these commissions have been set up to deal with the governance questions that I mentioned earlier. We have land commissions to deal with the land question. We have national cohesion commissions to deal with ethnic divisions. We have truth and justice commissions to deal with historical injustices. We have electoral and boundaries commissions in many of our countries to deal with the question of representation and elections. We have anti-corruption commissions to deal with corruption and state capture. We have com police commissions to deal with the administration of justice and several constitutional commissions to safeguard constitutionalism. And as we heard from Joki Wamae in the video, commissions are often criticized for buying time, burying issues, um, justifying governmental action, and for being a waste of time and resources. And I see Jonathan nodding his head, being a waste of time. In fact, critics often warn that the establishment of a commission is usually an indication that the government has no intention of doing anything about the problem. As Shabanji Opuka notes, no doubt some well-placed folks will find their way on this ultimate commission and deliver yet another report to the authorities. If you fancy a job, if you fancy a job for which you will not be held accountable, just seek to sit on a commission, earn an allowance, buy yourself an apartment, take a nice holiday, and put your feet in relaxation. Like many human trends, our vocabulary on commissions and task forces has been mutating like the H1N1 virus, destroying everything in its wake. And in his poem titled, The Ministry of Commissions, Mike Van Gran, another former STS fellow, captures South Africa too as a commission-weary society, with a commission for this and a commission for that. Government commissions into government omissions, when all that's needed are leadership decisions, he argues. By describing commissions as a ministry, he captures how much Commissions are taking a lot of governance space in many African countries. And notwithstanding these criticisms, 
Recent trends show that African governments continue to use commissions and their use is in fact escalating. Michael Bishop, another South African scholar, for instance, has argued that at one point in South Africa, there were at least six commissions of inquiry running simultaneously. A provincial commission into policing in Kailitsa, presidential commissions into the arms deal and the massacre at Marikana, a ministerial commission into brutal evictions in Luandle, a competition commission into investigating into the private medical industry, and a departmental commission into the collapse of a mall in Tongat in KwaZulu-Natal. And another one, into the dysfunctional National Prosecuting Authority. Like Kenya, South Africans too have in the recent past questioned whether South Africa needs a commission into commissions. And as ESO, another former ESO Lomso fellow from Nigeria said to me, this was also true of the Buhari administration in Nigeria. Jonathan, you can confirm that for us. Um, interestingly, this actually did happen in England in 1966 and in Canada in 1979 when the Canadian and English governments set up commissions to inquire into the state of commissions in their governments. Many African countries continue to turn to commissions to examine just about everything. Commissions continue to produce numerous reports, statutes, constitutions, and legislative instruments, and thereby continue to wield power on social, economic, and legal landscapes. And as Ferial Hafaji notes in her book titled, The Days of Zondo, and I quote, I do hope that the commission does not become a historical archive of capture, a place we can one day point to as we seek explanations of how South Africa fared or flared. There should be much scholarship and assessment that greets the arrival of reports so potent in their excavation. A commission's life does not come to an end once it produces a report. In reality, a commission's work endures in multiple ways. The reports not only give birth to recommendations, but to modes of truth production, alternative modes of legal and social thought, to different styles of governance and management. Commissions are a technology that in many ways wield grand influence on knowledge production. What is it about commissions that makes African governments continue to use them in spite of all the criticisms that we continue to channel against these commissions. What is it about them? Conventional legal doctrines and practices characterize commissions as administrative agencies exercising delegated power and authority. The law and practicing commissions in Africa challenges this conventional narrative. While commissions have historically been studied taught and understood as a monolithic practice set up by the executive branch of government, exercising only delegated powers and yielding those powers back to the state or to the executive with the final reports, commissions are producing new tools for understanding African governance, challenged traditional understandings of law and governance, and have thus provided alternative discursive spaces for deliberation of contentious issues in African social political context. In essence, the conventional understanding is that commissions are subsidiary, temporary spin-offs of the executive branch, but this is no longer the case in many African countries. Commissions are not only an ad hoc feature in African societies, but have become permanent creatures of governance. In South Africa, for instance, the constitution has constitutionalized about eight permanent commissions. In Kenya, the constitution constitutionalizes 12 constitutional commissions and requires parliament to create other constitutional commissions. Thanks to their 2013 constitution, Zimbabwe too has three permanent constitutional commissions entrenched in their constitution. This include the Electoral Commission, the Anti-Corruption Commission, and the Media Commission. And many of the countries 
actually have all these commissions. I've not been able to find one in Sao Tome and Principe and in Western Sahara, but in every other country, there are constitutional commissions or statutory commissions that have been permanently um, entrenched as constitutional um, commissions or statutory commissions. So this, Ghana too has constitutionalized commissions, making them permanent creatures of government. These constitutional commissions have been put in place to protect the sovereignty of the people, to promote constitutionalism and secure observance by the state organs of democratic values and principles. Have commissions as they are used in Africa, remain true to their classical roots. Their classical roots being um, the English classical roots. Co commission scholars have often cited the, the Doomsday Survey in England, which was ordered by William the Conqueror as the very first commission that was established. And this commission would ultimately globalize and find its way into the African social political context. And my question is, have commissions, as they are used in Africa, remained true to their classical roots? How have they behaved in their encounter with African social political context? Commissions, what I have found is that commissions in their encounter with African social political realities have evolved and mutated to at least three kinds, three models, three types of commissions. And I call them the classical commission, the social commission, and the hybrid commission. The classical commission, like its name suggests, applies a formal vision of law. It applies the classical legal thought as embodied in the London Conference that we spoke about earlier. The classical commission is characterized by a vision of law that is committed to three main traits, legal formalism, the public-private distinction, as well as parliamentary sovereignty. This include many of the judicial inquiries, such as the Akivumi Commission of Inquiry of 1997 in Kenya, which was headed by a judge and recommended the prosecution of various individuals and forwarded the report to the president. We also have what I call the social commission. The social commission is more pluralist. I'll call this the Wanjiko Commission, as um, Pumla mentioned earlier, Wanjiko and the Whig. This is the Wanjiko Commission. Wanjiko means the ordinary man and woman, the people. The social commission is more pluralist. It's more contextual. It's conducted in the form of a public hearing. People speak in their own languages. It is more inclusive. The commission process is less formal, more empiricist, interdisciplinary, and resistant to classical legal thought. It is endogenous. I am because we are, and since we are, therefore I am. Ubuntu are some of the principles that you find being embodied in the social commission. But it also has elements that resemble the global reaction to classical formalism or legal formalism. Mm -hmm. The commission is committed to people's participation, legal pluralism, people's sovereignty, and attempts to break down the public-private distinction and many of the other boundaries that I mentioned earlier. Many constitution review processes, such as the Constitution of Kenya Review Commission process in Kenya, Ghana's constitutional review process, are examples of this model. The Social Commission continues to be a favored tool because it provides a forum for intervention between opposing forces with a view to managing the tensions between them. Members of the commission need not be lawyers or judges. The Independent Commission of Inquiry into the death of uh, Nobat Zongo in Burkina Faso, for instance, had civil society representatives who outnumbered government officials taking part in that commission. And just like the Bishop Sulumeti Committee that developed the legislative framework for constitutional review in Kenya, the Commission of Inquiry into the July 2011 riots in Malawi was chaired by a Catholic bishop. And of course, an Anglican priest chaired the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission. In Burkina Faso, the council, uh, a, a council of wise men was appointed to take further the work of the commission. Commission design matters. 
Social commissions, such as, the, uh, such as the Constitution of Kenya Review Commission in Kenya, were a site to dismantle the enduring legacies of colonialism by decolonizing constitution making. The commission also sought to ensure that the law would mirror the reality on the ground. These forums challenge the formality of legal processes. They, fo they challenge the Whig. They challenge and expanded formal court-like processes. Social commissions uh, challenges the formality of legal processes through language. And some scholars, such as Christoph Heinz, have argued that the Kailitsa Commission in South Africa was termed the People's Commission because it broke down the boundaries of law by ensuring that the commission traveled and came close to the people and was open to the public. Like Gambia, Zambia, and Ghana, constitution review processes. The Kenyan constitution review process sought to bring constitution making process closer to the people. During the process, people presented their views in their own languages, in their own tongues. Women's rights organizations, human rights organizations, they presented their views in their own languages and in their own way and did not stand um, you know, with an affidavit uh, like it was a courtroom with very difficult, they just spoke in their own languages and in their own tongues. The Muslims, the Christians, the persons with disabilities, the pastoralists, and the lawyers, and so on. The people wanted their views presented in their own words and in their own languages. Language played a key role in the production of comprehending how Africans understand, organize, and transmit knowledge to successive generations, both through oral and written traditions and through aesthetic practices. They spoke in English, Swahili, their local languages. Indeed, language played a key role. It was a tool, a mediator, and an active ingredient that was central to the conceptualization and the creation of the new social contract, the new constitution. At the end of the process, the constitution, the commission produced a draft constitution that was eventually approved by parliament following intense negotiations between human rights organizations, between the youth, uh, religious groups, civil society, and many other groups. So even though the constitution was rejected in a referendum after a resurgence of ethnic conflict in 2007, 2008, the constitution making process that ensued thereafter through a committee of experts produced an almost identical constitution that was adopted by the people of Kenya in 2010. We also have what I call the hybrid commission. The hybrid commission is a blend of the classical and social commissions. It invokes formal and social processes by seeking both local and international intervention and legitimacy. It is born out of the need to ensure that the findings of the commission are effective and implemented. It is interventionist. It invokes both formal and informal rules of procedure. An example of the hybrid commission is the Waki Commission of Inquiry and the Darfur Commission of Inquiry in Sudan. In the case of the Waki Commission of Inquiry, the commission forwarded the report to the president and the newly appointed prime minister, as well as to a panel of eminent African persons, which was headed by Kofi Annan. So when the Kenyan government failed to establish a tribunal, the ICC prosecutor at the time, Louis Moreno Ocampo, opened the envelope. So rather than just have a report that would sit on the shelf, they decided to do an interesting thing, which was to um, have a secret envelope, a secret envelope containing the names of the people who are responsible for the violence. And then they forwarded that secret envelope to the ICC prosecutor. And the ICC prosecutor opened up the names, the first six names. We actually don't know who the other names are because he began with the first six. And that is how the former president and the former vice president found themselves facing charges at the International Criminal Court. 
whether or not a commission manages to successfully execute their mandate and implement their recommendations depends on several elements. It depends on the appointment process, who appoints and who is appointed. It depends on the genesis, the circumstances in which the commission emerged. It also depends on the purpose. What was the commission supposed to do? And what was the problem they sought to resolve? It also depends on the process. How was the process conducted? Was it a judicial hearing? Was it a public hearing? Did it match the problem which it was seeking to investigate? Was it open? Did it inv involve experts in the different areas, including um, uh, people who are not experts in that area so that it's inclusive, it's participatory? What about the findings? The findings depend. How, what did they find? How did they find what they found? So the findings also matter. The product, how did they consolidate their findings? Who did they include in consolidating their findings? It also depends, the action taken thereafter. What was the outcome or outcomes over the long term and the short term? Because with many of these commissions in the short term, it might look like nothing happened, but in the long term, you actually see that they are the reason why certain changes begin to happen in the, both in the legal context and in the social context. Actually, in the, in the English example and the Canadian example, uh, scholars such as Robert Feiner and, um, and, and Clarke Robinson have argued that there's no single statute during the 19th century that was produced other than as a result of the, a commission of inquiry. So commissions matter, commission design matters. After more than six decades of experience with classical legal thought, thousands of laws enacted the laws in many ways continues to be at variance with the reality on the ground. The dissonance demonstrates that the language of production of the law is very different from the language of distribution of the law. The language of the prosecutor is not the language of the accused. The language of the judge is not the language of the prosecutor. The language of the translator is not necessarily the language of the accused. And a poem co-produced by a renowned Kenyan artist, Ndungi Gidhuku, and myself aptly demonstrates this dissonance as the language of the law continues to be at variance with the language of everyday realities. The poem is titled, 60 Years Later. And it has a refrain, which I will invite you all to respond. And the refrain is, remember to remember, not to forget. After me. <laughs> remember to remember, not to forget. Anthony, Asante, Jonathan, Jennifer, the floor is yours. Pleasure. Today, 60 years after independence, when you rise up in court to represent me, represent me in a way that I understand. When you rise up to speak for me, speak in a language I can understand. When you file an injunction on my behalf, Wakili, do it in a manner I can understand. Remember to remember, not to forget. Remember to remember, not to forget. 60 years after independence, when you file that petition in court for me, when you sue the state for me, when you sue the president for me, do it in a way I may understand. When you represent me in a civil case, in my numerous incitement cases, in my freedom call cases, Wakiri, let it be in a language I can understand. Remember to remember, not to forget. Remember to remember, not to forget. So it's time to decolonize. 60 years later, decolonize legal education. Decolonize legal institutions. 
decolonize your legal communication, decolonize that 17th century barrister wig that suffocates your brilliant legal mind, free my mind from all colonial impressions, free your mind from outdated expressions, wackily, decolonize legal jargon, Remember to remember not to forget. Remember to remember not to forget. 60 years later, I now understand a Judas generis has nothing to do with a generous Judas. <laughs> Kumbe, kuyus, kuyus, solo, solo, said it, has little to do with planting and farmers. <laughs> Amicus Curie is quite far from a miraculous hot curry. <laughs> Res judicata has nothing close to a rust judge. Remember to remember not to forget. Remember to remember not to forget. It's not over yet. <laughs> We cannot still be independent. Why get rid of commissions? Let's get rid of the whole government. We must begin to think the unthinkable. We must begin to think the unimaginable. We must begin to dream the impossible dream. Remember to remember not to forget. And now that's the end. Please join me in appreciating Anthony, Asante, Jonathan, and Jennifer with a round of applause. <laughs> we must remember not to forget that if the law is to serve the people of Africa, it must respond to the realities of the ground, on the ground. Why do I need to go through so many procedural hurdles in order to hold title to my land? The non-lawyer detests the Whig for all its imperialism and formalism and wants their views and stories presented in their own words and in their own tongues as they fear that these legal processes could be just other government gimmicks. We must remember not to forget that the language of the legal profession and the state at large must be demystified and simplified through people-centered lawmaking processes. The law of commissions forces lawyers to reconsider their legal mentalities as much as commissions are often criticized for covering up delaying and obfuscating political stakes. The flexibility of the commission form allows for the discretion, for, for exercise of discretion, creativity in their procedures, experimentalism in their approach to law, interpretation of their mandate, and the resulting knowledge that they generate and certify. And as Chinua Achebe says in Things Fall Apart, Eneke, an African bird, has learned to fly without patching because men have learned to shoot without missing. Like Eneke the Bad, lawyers on the continent, we lawyers on the continent, must adjust ourselves to changing circumstances and adjust our formal way of thinking about law and governance. The future of law and governance lies in unpacking, in unraveling, and in understanding the law of commissions. I rest my case. Thank you, Nkatha. Uh, thinking from back from the future is all what Stiers is about. Thank you for doing that, and thank you for this wonderful lecture. Uh, I was asked to uh, acknowledge our online participants, which I'm happy to do. I've noted so many fellows, so I can't, I can't mention their names other than to say I wish you were all here to join in the conversation and, and in the celebration and uh, the reception afterwards. Uh, we'll take questions from the floor here. Uh, those who are online, please do use the chat function to type in any comments or questions there. We'll make sure that Nkatha get them, uh, and, um, uh, but we'll limit the, the Q&A to the room here. 
So let's start with any questions. I see Carlos first up. Thanks a lot, Inkata, for your brilliant conference. Uh, I've learned a lot. Uh, I have so many questions, but I'll focus on three very quick points. The first one has to do with particularity and universality. Uh, and how do you deal with this tension between being so singular and particular in the African continent, which is also very diverse, at the same time in a world that is extremely interdependent from uh, economic point of view, but also socially and culturally. I mean, all these languages and images and so on and so forth, they communicate across boundaries. So I think there is no doubt that we live in an interdependent world. How do we deal with interdependency uh, trying to be particular. Uh, my second question has to do with your uh, typology of commissions uh, in the African continent. I do not study constitutions. I'm a political science by training, right? Uh, but uh, I'm interested in constitutions as they are institutions that at a certain moment in time enact the result of social processes. And of course they matter. Right, because they are institutions, uh, but they can evolve. Right, and and I was curious to understand how you built this typology. Is it a kind of an empirical typology based on the actual mapping and the cartography that you have made on I don't know how many years of commissions in the African continent, or is it a kind of a Weberian uh, uh, ideal type uh, typology which has a theoretical background associated with it? If you could say a few words about that, and finally, and sorry for being so long. You, it, it was really tremendously interesting. Uh, you referred several times, not only to 60 years ago about London, but afterwards to uh, many experiences in the north, in the former metropolis of uh, uh, former colonies in Africa. You have not re referred to constitutional experiences in other developing regions. And I'm South American, I'm Brazilian, and I think that we have had some uh, uh, constitutional experiences uh, uh, in Ecuador, in, in Bolivia, where uh, the results of the natures of rights attributed, uh, uh, for example, to uh, Pachamama, to, uh, to, ma to, to a, a female divinity, to nature, to rivers, uh, come from another cosmology uh, which has nothing to do with the rationality of Western-based societies. But at the same time, perhaps, I don't know, I'm just wondering if these experiences of new constitutionalism in South America, if they could feed your processes here in Africa so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Of course, the wheels, they have many colors, many formats, they may made, made may be made of wood, of steel, I mean, many, many forms and, 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 constit and, and substances, but perhaps we can also learn uh, looking, uh, I mean, to the side, you know, I mean, looking from Africa to South America, from South America to Africa, I mean, across the Atlantic. Thanks so much for your brilliant talk. The, uh, thank you so much, Carlos. I really appreciate that um, intervention and proposal. Um, I have so much I could say in response to that, but let me see how, how, how we can do this. So as Pumla mentioned, this story of studying commissions began as a result of my own personal experiences. I had worked in the Constitution of Kenya Review Commission. I also worked at the Kenya Law Reform Commission. And as a result of working in those commissions, I found that what was happening um, in the commissions was out of step with what was going on in the courtroom and what we were teaching in the classroom about law. And that is what drew me to studying um, commissions. And then when I went to Harvard and I met many other African, uh, many other African uh, scholars, they would all tell me that, oh, but we also have this story. We also have this, uh, I mean, it's not a story of Kenyan exceptionalism. It's something that's happening in South Africa. It's something happening in Ghana, in Nigeria, in Uganda, and in other parts of 
the other parts of the continent. And when I came to Steers, most of the knowledge that I had was built on my Kenyan experience. But then when I shared this story, then I had all these South African scholars sharing their own experiences. And as a result of that, I began to see that there might be some points of convergence, even though there might be some points of divergence. And hence the, the particularity versus universalism um, uh, idea. There were some points of convergence. And what I found is that Many of the African scholars that I was meeting from the countries that I was mentioning, because I was even drawing reference to the particular fellows who would tell me something, or even the, the particular scholars who would say that, but that's not a story of Kenyan exceptionalism. It's happening in many parts of Africa. I've not met someone from Sao Tome and Princip and, and uh, Western Sahara, so I'm not able to say anything about those countries, but from the, my study, of the 56 African countries, I have found that there's no single country that has not either constitutionalized commissions or made them national or uh, uh, statutory commissions as part of the governance structures. Why this, uh, at this point, I'm not in a position to say that this is a story in African exceptionalism. And the reason is precisely because of what you have said, that there are other contexts, there's the Latin American context, there's the Asian context, and many other contexts, which every time I share my story, there are those who will say, but we have commissions in our country as well. And I have met, uh, when I went to Berlin and I gave the talk at, at Vico, there are those scholars who said that, but in Germany, we also had this tradition, but in, um, in Sweden, there was this uh, tradition. In, in Canada, in many of these countries, there is a tradition of commissions. But what I was able to distinguish distinguish as a feature without having studied the South American uh, commissions is that in the African context, they have been constitutionalized and they have been made permanent creatures of governance. And I'm looking forward to another phase where I might be able to explore more on the South American experience because I do believe that there is a lot that we can learn on commission design because it does matter. The typology of commissions is also drawn out of, out of this experience. At the beginning, it was informed by Duncan Kennedy's three globalizations. Duncan Kennedy typologizes three modes of legal consciousness that have traveled throughout history. And it begins with classical legal thought, social legal thought, and then uh, what he calls contemporary legal thought. But as uh, I proceeded, I realized that it has some elements that resemble what he described as classical legal thought. And Duncan, by the way, is very much influenced by the Weberian typolo typologies and so on. So you might see that the typologies I develop are actually influenced by Weber um, and, and Saussure, who influence uh, Duncan Kennedy in his three globalizations of law and legal thought. If Duncan Kennedy ever hears this, I hope I have not butchered what he said. Um, <laughs> But I know he trusts me. I'm a good student. So, uh, so it was inspired by that particular uh, theoretical framework. But as I said, um, the three, one commission I had worked at and then the other two commissions, I thought they were interesting because they were still out of step with commissions before that. And then what I found when I got the, the Iso Lomso Fellowship and I had the opportunity to study other African commissions was that I found that they were actually resembling these different kinds of typologies. The, the Kyolitsa Commission, which was more people-centered, was speaking a lot to that social commission where people are actually presenting their views. And then the hybrid commission I found was responding a lot to what was going on in Darfur. I would love for this typology to even evolve and become even uh, deeper and better as I explore the South American experience. And thank you very much for that invitation. It sounds like a very interesting Thank you, project. C Carlos. We have uh, Simon next, and the, after the, Simon, the person next to you. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm, a, I'm a retired sociologist from Stellenbosch and a very proud former STIAS fellow. So thank you very much for the presentation. 
I hope I'm not going to be too critical, but I have a criticism, and the criticism has to do with the role of traditional authority and customary law in a debate about the future of law in Africa. And let me just try and, try and um, contextualize that. I've had, I've had doctoral students who've studied Luanda. Um, they've studied um, uh, Kinshasa in, in, the, in the Democratic Republic of Congo and Yaounde. And all three, looking at the history of urbanization, have needed to spend a lot of time looking at the role of traditional authority and customary law in the ways in which those three cities have developed. And if I may give you a very, a very short South African example, the city of Durban is in the metropolitan area of Etequini. Etequini has land more than Durban had in the, in, in the rolling hills of the old homeland or Botestan of KwaZulu. So you have, you have Amakosi, you have Zulu chiefs living inside Etequini, the metropolitan area which incorporates Durban. And they apply um, customary law to the land in and around their clans area. And this is in the metropolitan area of South Africa. There has yet to be um, a cadastral, a survey done, so the land is communal land legally. Now from, from the, the metropolitan area side, you have wards, South African have wards, and you have elected ward councillors. So if you are living in this particular clan area, you have both the, the Zulu chief and his, and it's, it's a man, and his, his customary law rules of the game. And you also have an elected councillor, ward councillor, who applies statutory rules from the, from the metropolitan area. And I mean, this is, this is the reality. People are surprised by this in a metropolitan area in modern South Africa. So that, to me, is a kind of example, not only in South Africa, of the kind of issues, particularly given urbanization and urban, urban situations in Africa, maybe sub-Saharan Africa, which needs to be grappled with because you have both the customary law for the clan, and the clan is no longer the clan because you've got people moving into it on the one hand, and you have your statutory law from your city governments. And I'd like you to comment on how common this kind of challenge is. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I think you're absolutely right. This is precisely what I was describing when I talked about the kinds of tensions that continue to exist in many African social political contexts. So that is an example of classic tensions between tradition and modernity, between individual rights and community rights, where there's a shift that's happening as a result of modernization and capitalism, the introduction of different kinds of free market ideas, when there is continuity of the traditional um, the traditional ways in which we, indigenous knowledge, traditional knowledge that is produced as a result of customary law. So these are precisely the kinds of tensions which we find ourselves having to navigate as a governance challenge. And what we found is that the commission will actually look into those kinds of tensions and find different ways of navigating those particular tensions. The three commissions that I mentioned will actually have different approaches to dealing with the kind of tension that you've mentioned. In the Kenyan context, for instance, we have uh, constitutionalized the place of customary law, as well as international law, as well as um, uh, the, the English common law, all the, all the, it's a pluralistic society. So we have um, different kind of laws that are, that are coexisting in the same uh, legal system. We have Hindu laws, for instance, in the case of marriage, we have Hindu, Islamic, African, uh, uh, African traditional, um, uh, African traditional cultures and knowledge systems, including on environment, uh, natural resources, which have actually been constitutionalized as um, an acknowledged 
as ways of resolving disputes when it comes to the environment, when it comes to land, when it comes to alternative dispute resolution and alternative justice systems. So the coexistence of these contradictions or these ideas that pre-exist, um, that, that uh, as a result of the, the pre-colonial, colonial and post-colonial modes of legal consciousness are what are uh, constantly being navigated by the commission. And that's why I'm kind of talking about the commission as a technology, a technology that actually finds ways to mediate conflicting tensions, tensions which are not ordinarily reconcilable, but because they find it's a space for deliberating contentious issues, contentious issues which everybody is coming from different positions, the three different kinds of commissions that I've mentioned have found different ways of dealing with these particular tensions. The classical commission, for instance, will use a classical way of ensuring that individual rights, for instance, triumph over co community rights, that modernity triumphs over tradition, but that has not necessarily been the best way. The social commission has found ways of having a social approach where a pluralistic approach is applicable in in uh, the particular context. The hybrid approach finds a way of navigating those tensions using three different kinds of tools. It's both formal, it's both social, and um, uh, it takes a hybrid approach. So absolutely, I agree with you, and I do see that as a tension that is actually um, replicated in many parts of Africa as a result of the dual policy of colonial administration, which produced this tension between tradition and modernity. I am talking a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought I'd have nothing to say, sorry. <laughs> it's a topic that, that asks it, Nkatha, thank you. We had the person next to Simon, please introduce yourself. Hi Nkatha, my name is uh, Joshua Kibi. I'm also a Kenyan and I must say I'm very proud listening to you this evening. I'm not a lawyer, I'm into civil engineering. I'm a student pursuing PhD studies. Uh, my question dives directly into what you rightly identify as the gap or the lacuna or what we have in our constitution and what is being implemented is different. Now, you rightly say or you rightly identify the evolution of commissions. In Kenya, we have constitutionalized these commissions. I'll give you an example that you will directly relate to. JSC, you know what is happening. People are crying. IBC, we have gridlock. Now, please, in a nutshell, just identify the bottlenecks that led to where we are and what we are seeing as the possible solution to the future. Otherwise, I'm not sure if you're progressing as a country or even engineers now we have to become lawyers so that the country moves forward. Thank you. <laughs> That's fantastic. Actually, in Kenya now, everyone, uh, law is so much more accessible in many ways. And um, I'm really glad to hear that you went to you're considering becoming a lawyer, because you should, and get into that courtroom and challenge the kinds of things that you're seeing happening. So, in a nutshell, I will just say that the commissions that were established in the post-2010 uh, dispensation, it might not be a nutshell, sorry. <laughs> The commissions that were established in the post-2010 dispensation were established to safeguard constitutionalism. Kenyans had a history of, of having the government change the constitution over and over again. So Kenyans feared that anything that was not left to a commission would, lead them, it would leave them unprotected. And because the Constitution of Kenya Review Commission went around the country asking people what they wanted, how they wanted it, and gave them the flexibility and the freedom to be able to speak about what they wanted to see in the Constitution, Kenyans began to trust commissions as instruments of governance. So in fact, Kenyans would say, we want a fisheries commission to deal with issues for, fishery, for fishermen. We want a national heritage commission. We want, uh, uh, 
So there was, they wanted commissions for everything, to deal with every issue of governance, because they began to trust this process, because no one was wearing a wig, no one was wearing a robe, no one was talking a language that they did not understand. It became more people-centered, more social. That is why the Constitution of Kenya finds itself with so many constitutionalized commission, commissions. A commission to deal with the judiciary, a commission to deal with the executive, a commission to deal with public service, with teachers, elections, boundaries, um, human rights, gender equality, all, those, uh, all the different uh, governance questions and tensions that I mentioned earlier become the subject of a commission. But as I said earlier, commission design matters. How you design a commission matters. And what the three models tell us is that commissions will only be able to successfully implement their mandate if we play close attention to all the different elements of form, substance, and process, and the different kinds of techniques and tools that are being used in order to ensure that what they are doing is, um, that what they are doing sees the, the light of day. So the election commission, for example, the, by the way, there is no African country, except the ones I mentioned, Sao Tome and Principe and Western Sahara, which I didn't find but I don't know whether it's because it's another language. I didn't find commissions in those particular contexts. But almost every African country has an elections commission. These elections are usually considered to be so contested, and it's because of the erroneous, um, in many ways it's an erroneous analogy with the fact that, um, you know, that elections are the ways in which to be able to eat the cake. It's our turn to eat. Yeah. So the highly contentious nature of elections has actually been reproduced in the highly contentious nature of the electoral commission. How do you ensure independence when the money is coming from the executive, from the treasury? How do you ensure that there's independence of mandate and how they execute what they what they, what, what they are actually doing. Does it matter that the judicial service commissions that are being established now are very different from the ones before, which were being appointed by the president? But now we have judicial service commissions which are supposed, they are supposed, according to the law in the books, they are supposed to represent the face of Kenya. They're supposed to represent um, uh, uh, they're supposed to ensure that there's a new public management principle. So different ethnic groups need to be uh, need to be uh, represented on the on the commission. Different linguistic groups, different uh, uh, disciplinary backgrounds, as is written down in the constitution. Um, uh, um, so in essence, it is absolutely true that the language of production of the constitution is different from the language of distribution. So. The, the constitution was written in many ways through the voices of Wanjiku, through the voices of the people, but because of the enduring tensions that exist as a result of the implementation of the law through the Whig and classical legal thought, there is always that barrier. The language of production of the constitution is different. And in order for us to be able to find dissonance between the law in the books and the law in action, then we must decolonize the Whig. We must be able to see what actually um, decolonize the Whig, be able to ensure that the implementation process actually reflects what the people wanted. Thank you. Uh, we had Peter next. Thank you very much, Nkata, for this uh, presentation. I have two questions, uh, both of which uh, stem from your quite wonderful poem and the provocation that you gave us and with your uh, allies and the front here. Um, and in some ways, they also go back to several of the other uh, questions. Uh, the first is, I was wondering if you could say something about the power of not understanding in the law, as well as the power of understanding. Uh, obviously, 
not understanding is an old tradition, uh, legally speaking, that we all navigate. You know, we all sign forms that are pages and pages in length, that in tiny print, that none of us are going to read. And so it's it's quite institutionalized and and longstanding, and it's serving certain interests. But I'm also thinking about here the wig and robes, and they may be very bad uh, traditions handed down from the past, but they are ritual elements in a sense, in that they're, they're playing a certain kind of role that takes something out of everyday context and moves it into another zone, at least classically and in, in um, very old uh, understandings what ritual might be. And so I'm wondering about that, where not understanding as well as understanding might be important, which then leads me to my second question, which is trying to think about legitimacy uh, when law has legitimacy or doesn't, or when a commission is convincing or not, when it's taken to be, have authority or not. And the problem of maintaining legitimacy when you have differently situated actors who may have different understandings, what would make something legitimate, and sometimes perhaps contradictory ones, um, and then also when you have a form like the commission and when for 60 years you've had a commission and commissions become a thing themselves, uh, how you, you maintain the, leg the legitimacy of it over time uh, when people are not always satisfied with what commissions end up producing. But thank you again for your wonderful provocation. Uh, thank you so much, Peter, for for the questions. The power of not understanding, the power of understanding. Sounds like to be or not to be. <laughs> that is the question. <laughs> I do think that in this context, understanding, understanding means something different. It doesn't just mean about, it doesn't just mean that you understood what the judge was saying, or you understood what the law is saying uh, directly. It, understanding means what is the point of connection between the concept and the reality. A concept such as riparian land, a concept such as kujus kujus solo solo sedit, which means that you own the land above, below the earth and the land above the skies. How does that connect with communal land ownership uh, concepts where land is tied to the ancestors and to uh, intergenerational succession, where you have the Africans who are burying the umbilical cord to show the connection between the one who has been born with the ones who have been there before, the connection between the past and the present. So it's really about the concepts, the idea. And I think, Carlos, you mentioned this, you know, even the idea of a constitution. How does that relate with the realities that people are already used to? And in many ways, in our classes on commissions and governance, we continue to challenge this Montesquian uh, structure of government, where you have the executive, the legislator, and the judiciary. To what extent has that actually fared in many African countries? Does it actually work, that structure of government, which has now um, been reproduced in various models? Does it work? And commissions are a testimony to the fact that that classical government structure is not working. When we have, a, uh, we have public service commission, uh, we have um, uh, the electoral commission. We have commissions to deal with all the issues which the three arms of government are supposed to be dealing with. We have ju a judiciary commission to deal with the judiciary, uh, public service commission that's also dealing with some of the things that the, pub the executive is supposed to be dealing with. So in a sense, the dissonance that I'm referring to here in understanding is not just about translation, it's about is there a meeting of minds? And this is actually what I describe in Wanjiko and the Wig, the story of the dance between the two, Wanjiko and the Wig, the people and the, and the lawyer, 
Will there ever be a reconciliation of minds? It's not for them to, and it's not for the Wanjiko to understand the Whig. It's not for the people to understand the lawyer. And it's not for the lawyer to understand the, the, the Whig, uh, the, to understand Wanjiko in the ordinary sense. It's for there to be a meeting of consciousness. Are they, the language that they're using and the culture that they are reproducing, is it, are they marrying? Are they actually speaking to each other? So, to be or not to be. <laughs> the power of understanding. That's how I relate to what understanding is and what it means. Then on the question of legitimacy, that's a really very important question. And in fact, the models of commissions that continue to emerge are a response to this question of legitimacy. So classical commissions might not be considered legitimate in the sense that they are established by the president, it's a president who decides who the commissioners are. It's a president who decides, he is the one who gets the report, and he's the one who decides whether that, the commission report is actually going to see the light of day. So the commission can actually, the report can be kept in the shelves and nothing happens. How do you ensure legitimacy with the social commission? What has happened is you ensure legitimacy by ensuring that there are people participating, people who will actually own the process and the product. The hybrid commission legitimacy is a res as a result of having the international community and persons who are considered to be neutral or objective participating in the process. And that is the case for particularly when it comes to elections. Should you have people from other countries who are not affiliated with the different ethnic groups or different ethnic affiliations who might be able to have a more neutral standpoint. Of course, this is still questionable and we can still uh, challenge that because of the question of capital flow. Who is getting money for what and how and who? Who will they? Uh, uh, what does the geopolitics of the time dictate? So there are certain ideas and certain people who might still end up sitting on a commission or so on because of particular um, uh, political interests. But that is also a model that has been used to try and ensure that there is legitimacy of the process and it, it's accepted by, not, by, by the people and as well um, by the people. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you for, for those questions. We're out of time. Uh, so, and there's a beautiful afternoon or evening to enjoy outside on the patio. Let me just uh, uh, conclude by saying, um, you know, how the way that 1960 stands as a beacon in the story. We look forward to how 2023 might become the beacon, this work that you've started. Um, we, we really look forward to, to your work as it progresses. There's much more conversation to be had. Uh, uh, and we look forward to being part of that as well. So thank you for all the contributions. And finally, once again, thank you, Nketa. Thank you very much. Thank you.